So, uh, good evening and welcome to this Bentley reunion. Oh, sorry, I mean this Making Michigan. Uh, the Bentley Library series on the history of the University of Michigan. I'm Gary Krenz, uh, the director of the Judy and Stanley Frankel uh, Detroit Observatory. Welcome, all of you, to the observatory and welcome to our uh, audience online on YouTube. Uh, I'm also extremely happy to have Fran Bluen join us this evening to talk about the remarkable collaboration between the Bentley Library and the Vatican Archives. Uh, it's a story about, among other things, important academic values, what can be accomplished when people of goodwill come together across institutions, how technological developments can suddenly make new things possible, how different archival philosophies push in very different directions, and of course, it's a story about an amazing repository of historical evidence. It's a story not without some tension and perhaps even a little intrigue, and I can't wait for the movie to come out, actually. But. <laughs> From 1981 to 2013, Fran Bluen served as director of the Bentley Historical Library. Those of you who know the great accomplishments and stature of the Bentley know that Fran has been a key architect of that U of M treasure. He has done extensive work in understanding archives in international context. From 1999 to 2014, he led an ongoing exchange between the University of Michigan and the State Archives Administration of China. He has also done work relating to archival issues in France, Denmark, Russia, and Brazil. He is the author, with William Rosenberg of the History Department, of Processing the Past, Contesting Authority in History and the Archives. He has served on, pardon me, he has served on a number of boards and commissions, most notably the Council for Library and Information Resources and the State of Michigan Historical Records Board. From 1984 to 2004, he led the effort about which he will speak tonight. That project was funded by a series of grants from the Getty Grant Program, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Lilly Endowment, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Fran arrived at U of M in 1974 as an archivist at the Bentley. Shortly thereafter, he completed a PhD in history at the University of Minnesota. He joined the faculty here in 1978 to develop a program in archival administration jointly housed in the history department and in the then called School of Library Science. He retired from his faculty appointment in 2017. He currently serves as archivist for St. Thomas Church Fifth Avenue in New York City. I've known Fran since the mid-1990s, and I really am honored to call him a dear friend. Uh, we first met when I was acting as the president's liaison to the Bentley Executive Committee and also working with him on the university's History and Traditions Committee, which he chaired. And I remember, this was in the very early days before my wife Barb uh, had met him, she observed one day, you always have a smile in the morning when you're going to be meeting with this Fran Bluen. <laughs> And she was right, and I expect that I'm not the only person who feels that way. Fran is a fount of goodwill and sage advice. So please welcome me in joining, in, uh, uh, well, please join me in welcoming Fran Bluen. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. That's a very kind introduction. And, and uh, I was always smiling when I had a meeting with Gary Krenz, too. So, uh, and that continues uh, to this day. Um, I want to thank everyone from the Bentley. This is wonderful to see everyone. Um, um, you're going to hear about stuff most of you lived through over, the, over those years, and um, maybe you'll learn a little something about what I did, was doing uh, uh, all those days that I wasn't at the Bentley and, and uh, over in Rome, eating pizza and doing a few more things. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's a great pleasure to talk about a project, and um, What's interesting is uh, that the project began in 1984, and I'm using the end date of 2023 because it's still going on. So uh, that is um, why I'm pleased to have a chance to talk with you tonight. The, um, what I want to do tonight is just introduce the Vatican Archives, uh, talk a little bit about the facilities, what is it and, and where is it, uh, the history of the archives, a very brief history, uh, and then show you a few selected documents to give you a sense of the extraordinary range uh, of the collection. It, it, it currently occupies over 45 miles of shelving uh, with the earliest records going back to the ninth century. So it's, a, it's an extraordinary uh, world treasure. And then I will conclude uh, with a lengthy conclusion on the history of the Vatican Archives Project at the University of Michigan. 
So let me just give you a few brief things. This is um, uh, Vatican City, and uh, many of you have visited it, I'm sure, but I did not realize that when you were wandering around the Vatican museums, you were also wandering around this uh, 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 lo location of the Vatican um, uh, archive. How do you do the pointer on this? Do you, this whoops. Yeah, it's the... Uh, where is it? It's it's that the, one there? Do you see it? Yeah. Oh, there. Well, there it is. Okay. Um, most of you who have, who have visited uh, the Vatican come in this way through St. Peter's Square. If you're coming in to do research or for business reasons, you enter in over here. And you walk up into this Belvedere complex that was built in the 16th century, most of it. And uh, in there are the long corridors you've walked through for the Vatican Library, if you know, Vatican Museums, rather. Uh, Sistine Chapel is over here. Um, the, the entrance to the archives is right here. And all of this is the Vatican archives. Uh, above and below those corridors of the museum. On the other side, all of this. In addition, um, the archives, when I was working with them on the, the uh, construction of St. Peter's, the Fab Fabrica de San Pietro, was housed in the ceiling of the uh, cathedral up here, in this little corner. It used to take a little elevator all the way up to get there. Uh, in addition, over here is the um, uh, 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 offices of what they call the Holy Office, and that's the archives of the Congregation of Doctrine of the Faith, which I'll talk about later. And then outside of all of this, in the Piazza di Spagna, historically, though it's moved, was the archives of the uh, what they call the propaganda fide, uh, or the missionary arm of the, of the Holy See. So the uh, archives occupies an enormous a range of space uh, within the Vatican. As they say, you enter in the cortile of the Belvedere. If you've gone to the Vatican Museums and you're walking toward the Sistine Chapel and you go to this little corridor and look out a window, you look into this courtyard. The archives uh, are in some wonderful rooms. These are the original rooms of the Vatican archives, um, outfitted in 1620. Uh, and for 400 years, this, these uh, rooms held the original papal registers, which were from the 12th to the 14th century. Uh, they've since been moved. This is another part uh, with diplomatic correspondence. When I talk later on about the pilot project that we did, we did it in, the, in these rooms. Uh, beyond the beautiful frescoed and, and historic rooms, there are normal stack rooms like these that go on and on forever. They are huge. And then some of you may know this area in the Vatican Museums uh, with this great courtyard. Well, under this courtyard are two floors of modern stacks that would, were constructed about uh, uh, probably 40, 50 years ago now, uh, but temperature, humidity controlled, and, and all of that. So it's quite a remarkable uh, uh, complex, and all of it funnels material into this, uh, the reading room, where you can consult. So the history of the, the archives uh, is very old and has an amazing history. It was first organized in the 12th century uh, with Innocent III acknowledging the need for some organized record keeping and launches the formal Vatican registers, which were the copies of letters that were sent out and about to heads of state and others uh, 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 in, the, in, 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 in the known world. Uh, then uh, later were emergence of, uh, the emergence of new uh, offices that uh, administered the, the whole operation uh, with names like the, the Dattery, the Apostolic Camera, the Chancery, Rota, Rota and uh, uh, those also began to uh, uh, produce records in, in substantial quantities even in the 13th and 14th century.
into a much more formal structure. Uh, with, with, it, it became a bureaucracy, essentially. And uh, as all bureaucracies do, it generated a lot of records. And so the archives by the 16th century become quite, quite bulky. 1611, Paul V separates the Vatican archives from the Vatican Library and, and uh, establishes those frescoed rooms I showed you. And 1656, Alexander VI ordered all inactive di diplomatic records to be deposited uh, in the archives. 1783, papal registers stored at Avignon were, were returned to Rome uh, and added to the Vatican archives. And in one of the most bizarre chapters in the history of any archive, I think in 1809, Napoleon, who had conquered Rome uh, and imprisoned the Pope, decided that he was going to transfer all archives uh, in his empire to Paris. And the first transfer was going to be the archives at the Vatican. So in 1809, he uh, transferred the entire holdings of the Vatican archives in 3,200 carts, ox carts, essentially, uh, all the way from Rome to Paris. And they remained in Paris until 1814. And however, to get everything back, only 2,200 carts were, were required. And it's uh, presumed that uh, some very judicious uh, uh, triage was done, including some of the very controversial records of the post-Reformation Inquisition, which turned up missing. In 1870, with the unification of Italy, the archives, uh, much of the Vatican archives, which were of administrative, uh, 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 um, which were established for administrative purposes for the papal states, I mean the sort of civic government of the papal states, those uh, archives were transferred to the state archives of Rome. Uh, so the, the, in 1870, the, the, the collection was divided. Then in 1881, the Vatican Archives was open for the first time to research. Leo XIII said, let them all come in and see what we've done. And, uh, and that, was, that, was, that, that, was, that was important. Uh, the, though the records were only, open, only available prior to 1815. You, know, the, you can't see modern things uh, there. Uh, in 1963, the, I don't know how to pronounce this, wrote Hoshka's play, The Deputy Premier. Some of you may know that. It was a famous play that uh, opened up the question, I was talking earlier, of um, uh, Pius XII and uh, the, the uh, uh, Nazi regime. And uh, that uh, inspired a, a, a huge uh, uh, demand uh, for papal documents to, to, to understand the role of the, of the church during the Second World War. And this um, uh, uh, tension went on for, for decades. And it actually was only, uh, as I see at the end here, 2020, when Pope Francis has actually opened the, the documents for the period of World War II. Uh, for, for research. A uh, couple of other things, just um, the, uh, 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 now, now uh, material is open until uh, 19, I think, uh, uh, 58, 58. And for years, uh, for centuries actually, from its beginning, the Vatican archives was known as the Archivio Segreto Vaticano, the secret, Vatican secret archives. And it was really meant to say that uh, it was a private archives, it was a royal archive, it was uh, subject, uh, there was no public right to, to access. But over the years, the name secret started, you know, created a lot of problems. <laughs> and finally, in 2019, uh, Pope Francis changes the name from the Vatican secret archives to the Vatican apostolic archives. So that, in a nutshell, is the... Uh, the, the history of the place, it's, 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 uh, it's, had, it's had its ups and downs uh, over, over the centuries. The holdings of the Vatican archives are nothing but spectacular. Uh, um, the things that you can find there amid the 45 miles of shelves uh, uh, are quite, quite, uh, quite amazing. Uh, this, for example, is one of my favorites. This is the papal bull in set, inter cetera uh, from March 4th, 1493. Uh, and this is when Alexander VI divided the world between Spain and Portugal with one letter. Oops. Um, let's see, these are, 
Um, here's an example of the Vatican Register. This is a letter from John the, uh, Pope John VIII from the 11th century. There are volumes of these letters in the series of Vatican registers. This is, this is the earliest volume, volume number one. Here from 1521 is the a letter of excommunication of Martin Luther. Here uh, is a 1582 publication uh, uh, examining some of the problems with the Julian calendar. And I put this in in homage to the fact that I'm giving this talk in the observatory. Uh, the Vatican, as I showed you, the entrance to the, 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 the library, uh, the archives there is uh, right here, if I can get this to work, right here. Uh, but then there's this tower. Uh, this tower was built in 1560 uh, and was a small observatory. And in the main room of that tower are frescoes of the four winds. And this is the fresco of the south wind. And if you look at it, you can see way up at the top a, a white, white dot. Uh, that's a hole in the wall that the sun shines through and casts a beam on a meridian carved into the floor. And in 1583, Vatican astronomers sat in that room for a year calculating the uh, current calendar we use, the Gregorian calendar. Here is a letter um, urge, uh, from the Lords assembled in England urging the Pope to grant Henry VIII an annulment of his first marriage. And all those red ribbons and, and seals are, are the, the signature of those signing on to this position, which failed, of course. But I'm told that this is the origin of the, 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 the notion of bureaucratic red tape. <laughs> Here, uh, uh, in miscellaneous Amaria number 10, if you look in there, you'll find the proceedings of the trial of Galileo. Here um, is a seating chart for the conclave uh, held uh, after the death of Paul, Pope Paul III. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> and after that, Julius III was elected. It's the seating chart where the people were supposed to sit in the Sistine Chapel in order to carve the votes, as is still the tradition uh, today. I put that in there because during this inter, uh, sede vacante, they call it, this vacant period between papacies, Michelangelo was nervous that his employees were not going to get paid properly. And this is a letter he wrote uh, to that effect uh, in 1550, uh, securing, hoping to secure funds for his workers uh, during that, uh, that uh, uh, sede vacante. This is an interesting letter uh, in the Quech, I don't know how to pronounce this exactly, the Quechua language of Peru. It's a letter of Clement VI, VIII in uh, um, 1603 to, uh, to the, the, the indigenous population, um, celebrating the work of a Jesuit who was uh, doing uh, uh, um, uh, you know, missionary work, work at the time. But it's one of the few documents in the Vatican archives that's uh, in indigenous language. Oops, wait a minute. Here's the uh, draft of the famous uh, encyclical on social justice by Leo XIII in 1891. And then, oops, I keep doing this. And then, uh, finally, uh, this is from the archives of the a congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, which I'll talk about later. Uh, but that, that congregation includes the Index of Forbidden Books. And this is a, pro, pro, uh, a, a, a promulgation uh, of 1616, uh, critical of a particular edition of the work of Copernicus. It, did not, it was not against Copernicus himself, but it was against the editor who um, uh, claimed that, the sci that this scientific a work was more accurate than Holy Scripture, and he, that had to be erased before publication was allowed. As I say, there are other major holdings of the Vatican archives, uh, and this becomes important when we consider what we did. Uh, um, there's the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples of the Propaganda Fide, that arm of the Catholic Church uh, in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries had responsibility for all of the world. 
except for Southern Europe, all of the world. The, our Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, or, or Holy Office, including the Post-Reformation Inquisition and Index of Forbidden Books, the Fabrica, which was the archive of the, um, uh, uh, of the building of St. Peter's Basilica, uh, the Archivio de Stato of Rome, which has the letters of the government, gover 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 uh, governmental processes of the Papal States. The Vatican Library also has a lot of archives which over the year have been transferred to it, including the Capella Musicale Pontificia, which has uh, most of the original manuscripts of the composer uh, Palestrina. So, and then there are other things. There's uh, the Archives Nationale in Paris still has some things left over from Napoleon's uh, venture. Trinity College Dublin has some Inquisitions manuscripts that got there and it's, nobody knows really how. Uh, and there also are still papal um, materials in the archives of Alcluse in France which relate to the Avignon period. So this stuff, it's, it's a complicated collection. So the central question then for tonight is how did the Bentley Library <laughs> end up providing the scholarly world with the first comprehensive guide ever done to the archival holdings of the Vatican. So that's, I'm gonna tell you that story. <laughs> so the initial idea um, to begin with, uh, in the late uh, 1970s, I was involved with a project to help the Archdiocese of Detroit modernize its archives. And in that process, I met two people, Father Frank Canfield of Gross Point and Sister Claudia Carlin former librarian of Marygrove College and of the North American College in Rome. In the early 1980s, the two of them were working with the then prefect of the Vatican Library, uh, 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 Alphonse Stickler from Austria, to establish an American branch of the Friends of the Vatican Library. You all know about Friends groups. <laughs> so they asked me to join that effort as a member of the board. So in 1984, it was announced that there would be a new prefect of the Vatican Library, an Irish priest named Father Leonard Boyle. So Frank Canfield and I traveled to Rome that fall to meet him. So while there, since I was teaching a course on archives uh, here, uh, and I was curious, I asked if I could take a look at the Vatican archives, especially the area housing the index and finding aids, see how it all, see how it all worked. I was struck with how difficult it was to navigate. And I met the then newly appointed prefect, Father Joseph Metzler, who gave me a tour of the stacks. And seeing the material physically organized, grouped together by Fond in the stacks made the, 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 just the whole organization of the archives much clearer. Uh, it cr cr just presented a clarity you couldn't get just by going into the index room and looking at these various finding aids. And at, so at the time, though, uh, there existed only two guides to the uh, Vatican archives, and I brought them with me. One is this slender volume uh, in, from 1951 by Carl Fink in German, uh, and the other was Father Leonard Boyle, who was the new prefect of the library, uh, another slender volume which vote, uh, looked primarily at medieval records. Each in its own way provided information, but for only about 25% of the holdings of the archives. The information provided by the archives itself, this is all they give you. If you want to know what's in the Vatican archives, even today, is this little list of just titles, titles of, of series, grouped sort of uh, haphazardly by, by, by the office that uh, that created them. And for the archivists in the room, you know how important it is to link records to the office that created them. So the, um, the guides had their, their problems. And uh, let's see, that's the guide. So I had several meetings with Father Boyle, who spoke perfect English, and I was really impressed with his vision for the library. He wanted it to become more than a place where people came to find things. Rather, he wanted it to be a research center. He said, though, he had no authority over the Vatican archives. He really wanted the inst two institutions to be more integrated into a single research entity. 
He also was interested in the newly emerging information technology, which was pretty, pretty new and emerging uh, in, uh, in 1984. So we, we talked at length about the difficulties of finding aids in the archives, which he understood from doing his own guide. No comprehensive guide had ever been attempted, so the full extent of the collection of the Vatican archives was not known. You could not find it out. So we talked about the need for the integrated gateway to research resources of the library. We talked about maybe an integrated computer-based catalog uh, that would, would integrate the archives and library materials. Um, and, uh, but you know, it was just sort of a general discussion. But at the same time, the library and archives profession in the USA uh, were de developing a variation of the machine-readable cataloging format. Many of you who are connected to libraries will remember Mark. I mean, I guess we still use it, don't we? I'm, isn't, don't we still use Mark? Yeah, I've been out of it for a while. Uh, um, so um, we at the Bentley Library were moving ahead creating a Mark-based uh, uh, system to record and describe the holdings of, of our collection. It was a massive job. So I began to correspond with the archivist, Father Metzger, about doing a census of the archives, visiting every shelf of the archives, and perhaps preparing mark records for each identifiable piece that was re really quite easily identifiable in the stacks of the, of, uh, of, of the archives. So, let me see. There I am in 1985 uh, uh, with Father Boyle in the stacks of the Vatican uh, uh, library, that room where we're standing holds 60,000 manuscript volumes uh, from the Middle Ages through to the 17th century. And then the lower photo, uh, photo is my making a pitch uh, to Father uh, Metzler in the Vatican archives. Now, uh, so I, I had this idea, and then at the same time, lots was happening at the same time, uh, John Darms, many of you will know, remember John Darms, uh, um, who at the time was dean of the graduate school uh, and also was a former uh, head of the uh, uh, American Academy in Rome. He was intrigued by what I was thinking about and uh, immediately got on the phone and called uh, Sophie Consagra, who was the, the president of the American Academy in Rome, and her office was in New York. So I went to New York to meet her to discuss my interest in a possible project. And in her position at the American Academy, she had the occasion to meet many scholars who were frustrated in how they could work with the, the holdings of the Vatican archives. So uh, she became quite enthused and, and encouraging about what I was thinking. So in 1986 then, kind of moving this along, I visited with Father Metzler in Rome and suggested that we would try to organize a project that would describe the holdings of the archives in a way that was compatible with the latest information technology. Essentially, I was thinking of doing a mark-based description of all the holdings of the Vatican archives. This clearly would be a major undertaking, requiring substantial funding. So the question then was, how would the Bentley Library convince anyone to give it money to do this work? The, um, in the spring of 1987, I traveled to, Father, uh, to Rome and met with Father Metzger at the archives and proposed that we would do a test project. Pushed a good bit by Father Boyle, who was very, really wanted this to happen. Um, I, uh, uh, um, and, and Father Metzger thought he should do something about technology. I mean, it was in the air, but he really didn't know what, what, what to do. Um, so he was interested particularly in something that would embrace the entire contents of the Vatican archives. So we were on the same page there. So he suggested that we begin with fonds of the Secretary of State, with the series of the, the Secretary of State for the period 1507 to 1815. So at the same time, Sophie Consagra had introduced me to several scholars who were willing to really underscore the need for this work uh, uh, based on their own research. And I, uh, through my own contacts in this archival world, uh, they found many uh, experienced archivists who could validate the, 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 the methodology we were going to use. So the pieces were starting to come, to get, come together. With that, in 1987, and here on the right, you can see uh, 
uh, and with a, a, a kind of pilot project grant from the Vice President for Research here at the University of Michigan, um, I, along with Tom Powers and Len Coombs, both staff members of the Bentley Library, and I think Len Coombs is watching, so I want to just say, Len, I still appreciate what you did. Uh, I'm not sure if Tom is, I'd appreciate Tom too, but I'm not sure if he's watching. Um, so we uh, traveled to Rome uh, that fall to do the work. And through Sophie Consagra, we were in residence at the American Academy in Rome, where we also could meet scholars and talk about our work in that, 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 that community. So uh, in the three weeks we were there, uh, the work proceeded efficiently. Len and Tom, who you know, just quintessentially accomplished great archivists, were able to move through uh, and create mark records for the various groupings. In the course of three weeks, we had created mark records for 50 of the um, diplomatic records uh, for, from, from, from that, that, that section of the archives. So the result was uh, a full uh, uh, mark-based description, as I say, of that uh, section. So with those result in, the results in hand, and with the uh, support of scholars noting the need for the project, and with the support of archivists validating the approach, I began to look for funding. And we had, a, I'll outline the project in specific, specifics in a minute, but to make a very, very long story short and uh, to eliminate all the people who said no, um, <laughs> we uh, did get uh, a grant of $120,000 from the Getty Grant Program. Uh, and that was uh, matched by a grant of $112,000 from the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities. So the project we proposed was uh, we uh, decided it was important to have sufficient time to visit all parts of the Vatican archives. So we would need to have complete access to the stacks, and we were given that, it, because it was only by actually viewing each fond in the stacks that we could gather the information necessary to construct the individual mark records. We would thus plan to visit each stack area, build a mark record for each series we found on the shelves, and link those series or fonds to specific indexes with finding aids, wherever they, we, and there was, that's a whole other, I'm going to, I'm going very light on all the technical aspects of this, but um, uh, that we would, we would do that. So we designed a one year project with two staff visiting the stacks of the Vatican archives every day to do the work. And in those days, technology was new, and uh, we had portable computers that we could take into the stacks but uh, they were not light. <laughs> they were not light. And uh, we had to, and also uh, we found out that uh, for uh, safety reasons, uh, not every night after everyone left, the Vatican turned the electricity off in the whole operation. So we couldn't leave the computers there to charge overnight. <laughs> so we had to carry them, carry them home each night. But that was, that's, that's, that was technology in those days. Working on this project was uh, Elizabeth Yackel, graduate of the uh, School of Library Science at the University of Michigan, and now it's interim dean. Uh, and uh, she had been former, uh, the, formerly the archivist at the Archdiocese of Detroit. And the second person was Catherine Gill, who was a fellow of the American Academy in Rome, an historian from Yale University, who we met while we were at the American Academy. Uh, Beth Yackel had uh, experience in the description of archival fonds. It was up to date on the Mark AMC system. And Catherine Gill, a historian who had studied at the Vatican Archives' own School of Paleography and Diplomatics, uh, she had a particular understanding of the nature of the records and also the uh, various languages that were, uh, were, were in use. So as I say, I'm passing over a lot of technical matters here, but in short, we proposed to, do, to use the MARC system for, for, for archives to do the first ever complete survey of the holdings of the Vatican archives and to mount that information in a database. In the process of doing that, we had, um, there were challenges. And one of the big ones um, is here. You can see in our guide, this is the guide here that we did. Um, the, uh, and this is the area of what's called the Camera Apostolica. And the Camera Apost uh, uh, and how to describe that, that was, 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 was a problem for us, given what we were trying to do. 
Uh, this important sec section consist consisted of the financial records of the Holy See, and you know, the Holy See is the Catholic Church, the religious side, and the diplomatic side in that the Vatican is a nation state. Um, this, the financial records of the Holy See from 1279 to 1908, a massive amount of financial information. However, in 1870, uh, as I mentioned, the records of the Vatican archives, particularly those relating to the governance of the papal states, were separated out of the Vatican's own archive and moved to the Archivio di Stato of Rome. Well, in the process, they split the financial records. But nobody was ever satisfied with the way they were split because you know how financial records are. I mean, they, they, it wasn't neatly divided. Uh, where you had religious stuff on one side and, and government stuff on the other. So how to represent those records became a challenge. It was clear that we would have to include information on fonds outside of the Vatican archives. We would have to include information on all records of the camera. So we decided we would include the, the uh, records, all the records of the papal states that have been transferred from the Vatican archives into the Archivio di Stato of Rome. And uh, to do that, uh, fortunately, there were printed guides that had most of the information we needed. We, did, we didn't visit that archives and do the full survey. But the important thing was no longer was our work to describe the archives of the Vatican, I mean, the Vatic Archivio Segreto Vaticano, that one archival institution. But we were essentially, from this point on, using the organization of the Holy See itself to describe the records. And where the records were located was subordinate to how, how they related to the, um, uh, 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 the, the, the organization of the Holy See. So we then considered uh, separately housed documents in the archives of the Congregation for Evangelization of Peoples, the Propaganda Fide. Uh, we, were, uh, then, we then were introduced to uh, the archivist Anthony Ward, archivist for the Fabrica on the archives of the building of St. Peter's, and um, the project went from this to this. And fortunately, we were able to do that because we applied for and received additional grants from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and the Lilly Endowment, in addition to a second grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. So since we were linking all record series identified to specific uh, um, uh, uh, offices of the uh, Holy See, we needed to construct
So from that point, in 2004, the project was finished. Though over subsequent years, I did keep in touch with friends and colleagues at the Vatican Library. And I did learn, interesting, during the pandemic, to bring it up more recent, uh, during the pandemic, that the Hathi Trust had digitized the entire text of the Oxford volume and that it was searchable. However, it was restricted, access was restricted because of copyright. The, um, so uh, in May of uh, 2022, I decided to write a colleague at the library who I knew, Paula Manoni, the librarian for digital material, uh, to alert her of the availability of this new tool and offered to work through copyright issues, since the University of Michigan held the copyright, uh, to, to make the uh, digital version available for the Vatican Library. I heard nothing in reply, which was not unusual. In the fall of that year, though, I decided that I would travel to Rome in March, in the, I just did the following fall in, in March 2023. So in December 2022, in my regular Christmas card to the prefect of the Vatican Library, uh, I mentioned that I would be in the city and be glad to stop by, which I often did when I was in Rome. Uh, as the trip firmed up, I no notified the prefect, uh, Monsignor Pacini, of my dates in Rome, and he wrote back that I should stop by the Vatican Library for a meeting, meeting, <laughs> on, on, on March 9th. So I arrived that day at the Vatican Library, 10 a.m., for this meeting. Um, and let's see, I have a slide of that. Where is this? Yes. So there, in this uh, wonderfully, the ceiling is wonderfully frescoed from the 16th century that was once the main entry room to the reading room of the Vatican Library, uh, where the group, the group assembled. Um, Monsignor Passini on the, uh, on the right, uh, and then uh, right to left was uh, Monsignor uh, uh, Montavani, the new incoming prefect. Um, and then on the left side, me and, and, and uh, uh, Paolo Manoni. But then in the center is a man named, to my, and to my complete surprise, <laughs> was Paolo Vian, the newly appointed vice prefect of the Vatican Archives. This was the first time since 1993 I had a chance to talk to anyone from the Vatican Archives. The purpose of the meeting, it turned out, was twofold. The first was for Dr. Beyond to request formally that the digital information that we had created in, the, in, the, in preparation for this guide be transferred to the uh, Vatican Archives so they could make use of it. <laughs> then um, the second was to tell me that the Oxford Guide we had prepared 25 years earlier was extremely important to the Vatican Archives as it was finally contemplating preparing its own guide. Dr. Vian noted that for four centuries, the archives uh, of the archives, Vatican, the existence of the Vatican Archives, it was generally accepted that the collection was too complicated to sustain any effort to prepare a comprehensive guide. That was until the appearance of what we did. The group wanted to express their long overdue appreciation <laughs> and respect for our work. So subsequent to that meeting, I corresponded with Dr. Vian, who wanted to know more, more about the background. And a lot of what I'm telling you is what I told him uh, about the story of the project. In responding, he said, and I'm quoting, Thus, in the memory of the history of the Vatican Archives, your name, and he means all of us who worked on this project, will always be remembered for your courage, your dedication, your commitment to the um, enterprise. Any work such as ours in recent years for a guide to the Vatican Archive cannot be separated from yours and your work, which constitutes a milestone in the history of knowledge and description of the funds of the Vatican Archives. In recent years, in the archive, I have realized how truly complex uh, and difficult the work of a guide is, a work that makes your veins, uh, uh, your veins and pulses tremble. <laughs> For this reason, our admiration and gratitude towards you will increase and grow, not decrease as the years go by. I will keep you uh, uh, informed of the developments of our work, and we always count on your precious support and genuine, generous friendship. I mean, I just took my breath away. <laughs> <laughs> 
And just an interesting footnote here, and corresponding with this man, Paolo Vian, he mentioned how interested he was that I was connected to the University of Michigan because his father was here in 1933, working with William Warner Bishop on the Bishop Project uh, funded by the Carnegie Endowment to modernize the catalog for printed works at the Vatican Library. So anyway, um, Ben, in the in late summer of 2023, working with the University of Michigan Library staff, uh, because we did hold the copyright, we were able to get clearance to make the guide fully and freely accessible online and searchable through Hathi Trust. So finally, in 2023, we had the, uh, uh, the guide, we had the information available online, and we had the uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, imprimatur, if you will, uh, of the Vatican archives. So it was very, just to conclude, it was uh, very um, uh, curious to me years ago why no one in the Vatican archives had much interest in what we were doing. Father Boyle did and saw its potential, and upon reflection, I do believe that most of the staff of the Vatican archives thought we were on a fool's errand. Uh, that is, they thought we had undertaken a project that was doomed to failure because it was just never thought even to be possible. The assumption was that a comp comprehensive guide to the Vatican archives was impossible to achieve, let alone by a group of Americans. <laughs> so I think that was why it was so easy for Father Pagano to dismiss the project when he first became prefect. The publication of the book was evidence that we had not failed and thus must have taken the staff of the uh, Vatican archives by some surprise. What we had produced was by no means perfect. There were genuine flaws and errors, and I very much regret those. However, it's important to state what we had produced. We designed a framework that would identify all record groups in the Vatican, all record groups in the Vatican archives, and connect those groups to the offices of the Holy See that had generated those records. In the process, we had utilized a format that structured the data on each form throughout the archives and beyond in a uniform way. With this framework, we were able to seamlessly integrate and structure information on fonds generated by offices of the Holy See, but held in archives outside of the Vatican, outside of the Vatican archives proper. We were able to identify offices of the Holy See by which no records existed. And uh, finally, the framework of structured data was and remains compatible with contemporary design for online management and access systems for archival material. The work clearly went beyond uh, the, the frequently cited work that I showed you of Fink and Boyle. Though right now there is no plan for the Vatican Archives to create an online system, it is now, in my view, inevitable someday that I will not see, someday that will occur as, the, as this new project uh, uh, assembles information in a systematic way. Finally, out of all of this, and, and this is just a personal note, but uh, there's a new appreciation of our work. This new appreciation of our work has moved, emerged in tandem with a restoration of respect for Leonard Boyle, whose departure from the Vatican Library, and again, this is a long story, was a bit controversy and the worst of Vatican politics. He was without doubt the inspiration for this project and its constant guide. It is one piece of so many together that document his extraordinary vision for the Vatican Library and Archives. And interestingly, next Saturday, there's a symposium in his honor in Rome uh, on the date of the centenary of his birth. And among the many of his achievements that will be discussed will be mention of the Bentley Library and its work at the Vatican Archives. So thank you. Thank you so much, friend. That was fantastic. And I mean, you can see why I'm waiting for the movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> this, is just, uh, this is just wonderful. And there's so much that we could talk about um, here. I guess I want to start, though. You did a, you did a wonderful job uh, of avoiding uh, technical jargon and so forth. Uh, and you know, a lot of the people here are archivists, but a lot aren't. And you did, there is one term that uh, you used uh, frequently. Uh, that I wonder if you could just elaborate on a little bit for the lay people in the crowd, and that's the word font. Oh, right, right, right. That's uh, uh, um, it's really a European term, uh, and um, the uh, um, 
I mean, you can imagine that uh, in, in, in any organization creates records, so you have the, uh, um, and, and at least in the paper world, I don't comment on the digital world, uh, that's over, that's, that's, that's beyond me. Uh, but in the paper world, uh, you, you know, an organization would be divided between the personnel department and the finance department and the public relations department and you know, whatever. And each of those, um, uh, in the process of doing their work, would generate uh, records of some kind or another. So when those things are transferred to the archives, they are the archives of the X organization. Uh, and those records are divided into what we call in the United States record series. Uh, so there would be the record series of the, 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 the finance department, the record series of the personnel department, the record series of whatever. Uh, but in, in, in Europe, they, they call those fonds. Okay. And part of, a lot of this has to do with the contextualization, right? I mean, I mean, this project was one vast contextualization of these fonds in terms of the offices and the functions and things right. like that. And I wonder if you could say just a little more about that, because, because part of that was aimed at the ultimate users of this, or the ultimate envisioned users of yeah, this. Yeah, I mean, you can't see this, but um, basically what it means is, um, I'm just opening to one section here, the Penitentiary Apostolica, um, uh, and uh, it had jurisdictions for sacramental and non-sacramental uh, acts, and you have to read through it to get what that means. Um, but what we did was, in the case of this, we, we, we wrote a essentially a history, uh, and Claudia Carlin was an authority on papal documents, so the history is primarily the authority. Uh, so what authorities uh, led to the founding of this agency, uh, uh, um, changed its authority, what, what its work was supposed to be. So the idea is if you know something about uh, uh, what this, this penitentiary did, uh, and I'd have to read all the way through to tell you, uh, 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 then you can sort of predict what the, what the documents might be in this particular section of the archives. So the Roman Rota would be another. That's easier to understand. It's a, the judicial where they have trials. Uh, um, and so then following this uh, uh, description are lists of each of, each of the record group, each of the fonds. And for each of the fonds, we have standard descriptive categories, uh, which I could go into, but if you want to talk about it afterwards, we could do that. <laughs> but that's essentially, so contextualizing it really is relating the record series to the, the function of the agency that, that produced them. And partly the goal is, again, I mean, thinking about the sort of the, the users, I mean, uh, uh, you had mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, people who, I mean, here, here's this vast collection. It's not just the church, as you were making clear. I mean, right. this, is about, this is about European history. This is about world history. This is about uh, so much of the, the you know, humanity, right? Right. Uh, and uh, so then scholars who are operating in lots of different fields, beyond church history, for instance, uh, uh, have, have, have a new resource by which they can start to identify the where to look for what, they, what might be of interest to them. History of art, uh, women's history, anything like that. I mean, is there, can you say more about, about that? That's, that's a little bit harder, because once you veer away from the central purposes of the organization, uh, um, the central processes, for example, the uh, Congregation of Rites, which, which oversees all the processes for making saints. Uh, I know someone who's working in that area of the archives, for example. Um, I mean, you can find out which saints they were working on uh, and, and so forth. But when you get into you know, more contemporary themes of historical analysis, like the history of women or the history of indigenous people, um, how, you how you use those archives becomes more complicated, how you, what you look for, how you find it. Um, for example, uh, in the Congregation of Whites, you could look for women saints, for example. That's a popular topic now. Uh, in the Congregation of the uh, Propaganda Fide, it's interesting, uh, there's a famous book uh, by Ann Stoller, who used to be here at the University of Michigan, uh, interested in the indigenous uh, history of, uh, I think it was the Dutch, uh, um, 
a Dutch colony, in Dutch colonies, and, and using the official records of the, of the Dutch administration, you had to do what she said, read against the grain of the documents. In other words, the documents are created for one purpose, but you have to kind of read through them and, and in a subtle way, try to figure out other, other players in whatever transaction is involved. So it's, um, it's complicated. Yeah. So you know, you made you, it, it's certainly clear from the talk that uh, uh, you had initial I mean, strong support, uh, of course, from, from Father Boyle, and uh, and and enough support uh, to to complete the project. Right. Right. Uh, uh, but a lot of people, at, at a minimum, were not thrilled that you were doing this, and were even uh, you know even opposed. Uh, but you also had some friends who continued through the period that. that all, it ultimately led. Oh yeah, you know, and, and, and I, um, I mean, what was what was surprising is that we didn't really have opposition. That's why I, I do think we, they thought we were on a fool's errand. Yeah, I don't know what they're doing, but whatever it is, it's not going to work. <laughs> uh, um, so I mean, they didn't really even muster energy to oppose it. Uh, uh, they were just, you know, we just sort of went along our work. Uh, you know, and we didn't, we weren't dependent on them for money, so that was uh, there was no periodic reporting involved. So um, we kind of had this idea and worked it through. And um, Father Boyle was extremely helpful if there were uh, on a number of occasions, because he knew the archives pretty well. But um, uh, um, we weren't in a hostile environment at all. We were just in an environment where people really didn't know what we were doing. We weren't in the way, so. Uh, but even, even after, I mean, after the, after the work was done, and uh, uh, or basically done, uh, and you were you were you were excluded from the stacks, and it was made very clear to you that uh, that there was no official interest. In this, right, in this right. Project. I mean that was disappointing. That was disappointing. But but um, I mean it was great working with Oxford and getting it getting that imprimatur on on this press because um, I mean <laughs> they, I. Um, I knew we had to publish it. I mean, we had to do something. We had to publish it. Uh, it had, had to have some tangible thing. And I remember starting talking with the University of Michigan Press uh, about um, that maybe they would, do, they would be interested. And uh, uh, they were kind of talking about it. And it was a lot of information. And, um, and their solution was to have a kind of introductory volume with a packet of microfiche. Do you remember microfiche? <laughs> And I, you know, I was just sort of saying, you know, this is a, this is kind of important, and we need to have a press that, um, that's going to reach the world essentially. So I thought ideally it would be great if Oxford Press did it. So I wrote a blind letter to the editor and said, we're doing this work, and I think this would be great if you, <laughs> if you publish, publish this. And it made me feel good, and I thought, you know, <laughs> I'll find somebody. But two weeks later, they called, and we were off and running. <laughs> so maybe just a couple more uh, things, and then we'll open it to the uh, to the audience. Um, uh, you know, the, the 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 opening of the talk with all of these wonderful examples of uh, of parts of the holdings. Um, are there any particular moments that stand out for you when you were standing in the stacks and? And uh, we're just stunned by something, or when you, I mean, something, any, anything along those lines. Well, uh, that, that, that's an interesting question. I mean, one of the one of the secrets of doing this kind of work is you draw a line and say we're going to just drive things to this level, and we're not going deeper, because if you start doing that, I mean, you get stuck. I mean, if you get into these series, uh, you don't know what you're going to find. Um, uh, so we rarely got actually into the into the series. Things just as now I'm thinking, things that struck me. Um, there was a huge commission during World War II on World War II prisoners with pictures, and I remember being kind of stunned to find that and uh, you know the atrocities of World War II and how that was being documented. Um, that 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 was interesting. I remember there's a restricted part of the archives, we, the material after 1922 when we were, were doing the work. Um, but we could uh, see through the grate you know, what the stuff was. And we actually were allowed to go in and take the marked data, but we couldn't, we couldn't look at the volumes. But I remember 
uh, at the time uh, working on the series on the, uh, the, Nunci the uh, diplomatic mission to Vietnam. I thought that would be, that would, that would be interesting. Um, so things like that always kept you know, popping up. And, uh, right. Uh, so the last question is maybe, I mean, uh, this, this is going to be an unfair question, right? Uh, maybe too philosophical, but, but to whom does the, does the archives belong? I mean, on the one hand, obviously, it belongs to the, to the Catholic Church, right? It belongs to the Vatican. Uh, but you've completed a project that was completely outside of the Vatican operation that makes this all available to the world, right, in a, in a different way. And I just wonder if you have thoughts about who... who who are these archives for? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting, and I think that's really the challenge of, of, of really understanding the Vatican archives that's been going on for 400 years. I mean, essentially, the archives uh, are the archives of the Holy See generated in the course of doing its, doing its work. Um, so that's, uh, I mean, that, that's, that's who they're for, really. So then the challenge is for all those people who find this a useful window for topics outside of the uh, a range of, of the narrow, comparatively narrow purposes and direction of the Holy See. How do you dig into it and find it? Um, it's, uh, that's, that's a real challenge. And one of the things the uh, archives has done over the years is they have published uh, a bibliography of all work done by scholars at the Vatican Archives. So if you publish something, uh, you're supposed to send the public the citation to the archives so they can put it in this bibliography. So uh, um, that's kind of an acknowledgment, in my view, that, that this archive really is for a broader scholarly public where there are just hundreds of conversations going on informed by these records. And the only way, or at least one of the central ways of making that conversation useful in your own work is to visit these citations, work through the previous work done, and see what that suggests for possibilities. So okay, thank you. it's on two, two levels. Right, right. Yeah. OK, so uh, I'd like to open it up to the audience. If you would wait, please, for the microphone so that we can get you uh, on, the, uh, on the recording. Fran, I just wonder if you'll be at the event next weekend. No, I can't go. No. I, was <laughs> I thought about it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, excellent. So, um, um, how do you trust copyright? My, my window in the world, although they, I'm very curious. So the first round through, basically, Hadi Trust digitized stuff, but it wasn't made available. You could search it, but you couldn't, you couldn't read it. Is, is, have I got that right? So, uh, uh, well, the, 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 um, the, the book was digitized, and you could search it, and it would tell you the page number where right. your search... But you couldn't read it. You couldn't read it. But but it was under copyright. Uh, well, actually... Nothing written in 1541 is under copyright, but but in a but I understand I, I'm, people were, people were very cautious in those days. But then later, if I understand your story right, um, the work was in fact readable. Um, it was opened up, and what I'm curious about is whether the opening up part made the whole rest of the project not look like a fool's errand. Oh, I know what we can do with these books. We can read them. Um, no, no, it, it was a great step forward when we could do it. But we could only do that um, in the last six months or eight months or something. Um, uh, but no, I was uh, finally, you know, you can tell people instead of, I think this costs $250. Um, you know, you can, you can just go online and read it. And, and my understanding is anybody can read it on how he trusts. Isn't that right? You don't have to be. You don't have to be a member of. of anything. The, yeah. No. Yeah. So it's it's available. Thank you. Yeah. We have a question from uh, the online audience. Veronica asks uh, that she's currently researching the Bureau of Catholic Missions regarding U.S. Indian boarding schools. And they were really struck by your perspective on access and institutional culture mirroring one another. 
Um, she asks, when that's the case, do you have any advice for bypassing gatekeeping like that? Um, it's very difficult. Uh, um, it's, um, and I, I, I have not, uh, you know, I've not been to the Vatican archives really in 25 years. So um, uh, when I first started working there in the 1980s, if you wanted to use the Vatican archives, they actually gave you a form uh, a text form, and you sat down and literally wrote a letter to the Pope asking to use the archives, <laughs> saying what, what reason. I think now it, you don't do that. But <laughs> um, the, um, you, you, you have to tell, be pretty explicit as to what you want to use and why. At least that has been historically the case. Now there's no, uh, um, I mean, there's no religious test or anything, but uh, it's mainly whether the material is available. There was a question over here. I think. Yes. Uh, this is kind of a two-part question. Uh, if you could um, kind of go back in time and get another uh, hundred years added to your life and you want to do a phase two of this project, what would you do to um, make it a, extend the project, make it better, make it even more useful than it is? And second, well, yeah, I've often thought about that. Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, the, um, um, I mean, the, the big thing that's changed since we did this was the internet. I mean, we could do, we could do wonders with this, with the internet. You know, the visual representation of the organization, uh, change, changes. Uh, I mean, I sometimes just dream about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that really answered my second part of my second question, which was, what about AI? Does AI have any relevance to what? Well, that you know, that is. Uh, um, uh, um, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about that too. Paul, remember we were at a group the other night. Scott Page was talking about AI and the. Um, um, the idea of prediction, how you know, AI can assemble a lot of information that informs prediction. And I really have been thinking about that because um, unlike, uh, well, let's see, I mean, catalog, when you catalog a book, you sort of try to encapsulate the possible uses of it by subject terms and so forth. But archives doesn't do that. Archives, and the reason why context is so important for the archives is that the more you know about the agency that, 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 that produced the records, the processes, the context, whatever, the better you can predict what's going to be in, in, in those records. And um, I, Scott was saying, if you have artificial intelligence that can go through, as I said, this bibliographia, probably... 10,000 pages of citations. I mean, if somebody can go through all those texts and assemble them, uh, the knowledge you would have of the potential of each of those fonds or record series would be quite extraordinary. But I, you know, I, I dream about that too. <laughs> Don't do it. You're going to watch the free <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. So, could you hear me? Yes. I can't hear myself. Um, so, if you've got it all, say you could put it all online, what of your research, which I, from the size of that book is not a, actually a huge amount of information given the current state of things. Has anybody at the um, Vatican or elsewhere tried to digitize? That I'm sorry, I don't quite hear you. Have they tried to digitize that collection? Have they tried to? Digitize. Digit oh, digitize. You know, a la Google going away around and scanning just about I mean, anything. I mean, there are a lot of scanning is going on. I, I think uh, I didn't mention it, but there might, I, I saw somewhere where the archives claims to have, digit have, 17, have 7 million digital images. I don't know what that means. Um, I mean, I, I think it's when people write and want to dig get digital copies of things, they must be creating a, a back, I mean, they must be saving copies of all this digitization that they're doing. I have not seen any, um, any guy, this, this list that they put out uh, every year, 
Uh, it makes no note, mention of what's, if there's any digital access to any of this. So I, I just don't know. But 45 miles of archives going to be more than 7 million pages. Oh, no, I mean, that would be a drop in the bucket, but, but it, it's, it's something, right, right. Other questions? Just to gain physical access to the stacks, how unprecedented was that? It was totally unprecedented. We were the, I was the first time, it was, Father Boyle said it, he had, he, he couldn't get it, it was, and, and <laughs> we arrived in Rome. I, Beth was already, she got her apartment, Kath and they were all set. We arrived in Rome for the first day, we're getting ready to work, and Father Messer comes in and says, you know, the staff has decided we don't think you can get into the stacks. Um, <laughs> And he said, but we're going to give you two desks in the reading room, and everything you need will, will be brought to you. Oh, and I said, you know, that's everything. <laughs> so fortunately, I had correspondence where he signed off on that, and we had a little to do, but, but uh, we did get our, it, 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 was, it was unprecedented. And it was free, I was free, we were, we went anywhere. It was, it was. I mean, that, that, apart from just the seeing different things, just, just actually wandering the stacks was quite extraordinary. I can imagine. Anybody else? Um, I was just wondering how the experience of um, working in the Vatican archives compared to other projects that you've worked on, um, you know, with like maybe private and other private institutions or governments or things like that, like, um, cause it sounds like you had free reign. Is that uncommon or? I, I, what's the last part of the? Oh, it just sounded like you had like free reign at the Vatican. Is that common? Is that typical of your other archiving projects? I, I think my ear, ear hearing you isn't had, what it used had, to be. You had free reign at the Vatican. Was that like other places that you've been? Oh, thank you. Uh, um, 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 you know, I, I, I've been to many archives throughout the world, and of course, given great tours and seen seen wonderful things. Um, but it, it's very unusual to let people just wander through the archive. I mean, it, um, uh, I before or since have never, other than wandering the stacks of the Bentley Library, of course, <laughs> which is its own thrill. Uh, um, uh, never had a chance, something like that. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm curious if, in addition to paper archives, you were able to see any 3D archives, um, artifacts, or relics of the Vatican. Uh, if so, what was that like, and did you uh, include that in any of your archival research? No, we didn't do no three-dimensional objects. Uh, we did not. The Vatican uh, archives. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, um, the, the only the only three-dimensional things that are a big deal at the Vatican archives are seals, sealed document. You know, a seal. Uh, some have quite elaborate royal seals in, in terms of correspondence. So there's a whole division of the Vatican uh, archives that, that just deals with that. Uh, um, but um, no, the, um, uh, the, the, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith is interesting in that um, there's a, there was a section in the archives that dealt with... Um, I forget the Latin term, but it's essentially an excess of faith. You know, we think that, um, you know, they worry about, you know, people losing their faith. And, and, but these are people who had too much. Uh, and uh, they had drawings of objects, you know, that were just, you know, crucifixes with blood and, and you know, uh, uh, relics uh, uh, and, and things like that that um, they thought were a little over the top and should be reined in a little bit. But, <laughs> but we never, they, I, did, they, I saw the drawings of the objects, but I didn't see the objects per se. Thank you. Garrett, outside, uh, 
before a certain date, was everything on parchment? At what point did paper start coming in? Um, I mean, uh, with that, in 1588, with the establishment of the bureaucracy, uh, you know, paper was everywhere. I mean, there's just a lot of paper, even in the 16th century. Um, I don't, I, I couldn't really date the switch from parchment. Uh, the early registers are certainly on parchment, and some of the early monastic documents, which are the ones that go back to the 8th and 9th century, uh, those are parchment. But um, I don't, uh, I mean, there's just so, so much paper. Uh, um, I, I didn't see a lot of parchment. It certainly didn't work with it. Yeah. But it's interesting. The, the 1588 and the bureaucracy. I mean, in a way, the, the Vatican. I mean, the, the well, the, the, the Vatican. The church. It's it's a modern institution. It's an early modern institution. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there are very few bureaucracies established before that time. Right, and, right. and it was a bureaucracy that organized the 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 work of the organization around the globe mm -hmm. in 1588. Right. So yeah. it's, 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 it's the records are quite stunning. And, and yet, of course, also as like many long long lasting uh, institutions, there's a certain conservatism, just like with universities, right? Well, <laughs> built in, built in <laughs> that that would be an interesting question. But. <laughs> <laughs> we have an online question. John asks, have you read the book, The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco? Oh, yes, 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 um, yes, long time ago. It, it seems that the, um, sorry, he just did a, it seems that this novel was very informed about the culture of knowledge with the Vatican. Um, and John's curious, what do you think about that culture of knowledge in the Vatican, especially the tension between orthodoxy and modernity and how that came out in the archive? Yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's interesting. Um, I, I read a long time ago, and, and, and actually before I'd done this work. So um, I, um, um, I, I, I don't know where it's, I, I, I mean, there's a lot of stuff written on the Vatican uh, uh, and including the Vatican. I, I thought you were going to mention, uh, what's his name? Um, Dan Brown, you know. Though, so, um, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of exaggeration. Um, and uh, I mean, in a way, it's, it's kind of boring. Uh, I mean, it really is, they really are bureaucratic records, and they go on and on and on. <laughs> so the, um, um, it's, it, 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 we were just looking at it from a different point of view, and we weren't, we weren't looking for sensational things. Yeah. Okay. This is just a simple question. The Frank Can Father Frank Canfield you mentioned at the beginning was he a Jesuit? No, no, no. no. He was uh, uh, from the Archdiocese of Detroit. Yeah. Okay, maybe one last question if anybody has. has one. This is just a, a comment, but Fran, have, having been one of your staff people. Coming in just as you were getting through the, the big amount of work you were doing, um, I was aware of this project peripherally, but hearing about what you did tonight, your perseverance, uh, I am just in awe of this story, but more in awe of what you did to make it happen. <laughs> and the fact that at the very end now you are getting the validation, and it's looking like it's actually really extremely useful ongoing and into the future. I just want to say congratulations to you because there had to be a leader, and this came out of your head, and you persevered and you pushed, and I just find that that part of the story is the most remarkable to me. Well, thank you, Sarah. It's nice of you to say, and um, it was, uh, I, I, mean, th th I didn't have time really to, to connect all the people involved in this at every stage. Uh, um, so it was, um, it, it would have been impossible to do alone, but there were many, many people who uh, wanted to see this done. And um, it, uh, it was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually. Right. No, it was, it was always fun. I mean, it was just because, I mean, you, I mean, nobody goes to the Vatican thinking they're going to have a wonderful experience. I mean, it just, I mean, it, you know, you know, it's, uh, it, it's a very complicated place, and um, 
Um, I, I was fortunate to have met some wonderful people there. I mean, uh, so uh, uh, it was, uh, and, and none of it was a surprise. But how to navigate it was a challenge. <laughs> but thank you. That's great. And yes, thank you, Sally, for that, for that comment, too. That's, that's excellent. Well, Fran, thank you so much for well, this. Well, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be part of this group. Thank you. Thank you, to the, uh, thank you to the audience. Uh, our next session of Making Michigan will be December 7th. Uh, this will actually be my last Making Michigan uh, and one of my last formal acts as a U of M employee. So I've decided to take that opportunity to give a talk called Four Years of Making Michigan and Four Decades at Michigan, some reflections. I hope you'll join us. Uh, thanks to Andrew Rutledge for monitoring the YouTube commentary, and thanks for the, to the uh, Michigan media team. We're open Friday afternoons and Friday evenings for astronomy night. Uh, tonight's session will be available online in about a week. Uh, if you're here at the observatory, the observatory upstairs is going to be open until, uh, until 9 o'clock. We have student docents ready to share things about it. They're, they do a fantastic job. It's not quite as old as the Vatican archives, <laughs> but it has maybe, maybe some portion of the dust that's, <laughs> that's there. Anyway, it's, a, it's, it's the birth, birthplace of U of M as a research university. So please, if you have a little time, go on upstairs. Uh, I don't know if, uh, are we observing tonight? Maybe. Yeah, okay, okay. So you might be able to look through the telescope. Uh, if you're online, I hope you can get here sometime. Uh, until we all see each other again, be safe, stay, stay well, and keep hope. And good night. Thank you.